The issue with this narrative is that we certainly do have depth, but we don't have quality in that depth. We've seen with players like Tommy Asu who can't keep fit and Rob Holding who haven't exactly provided the best performances of the last few years for Arsenal, that we really need someone to help if Saliba is out injured or needs Pause. a rest. <laughs> Straight in, go on, what are we saying? I think Arsenal fans have forgotten about, have forgotten about Kieran Tierney, <laughs> no? They're trying to ship this man out. But when I watched yeah. Arsenal versus Palace on Monday Night Football, they were playing Tommy Asu as a left, left back. Kieran Tierney is, a, has, is Premier League proven, he's shown that he can perform for Arsenal. And the fact that they're trying to ship him out of the club is so surprising, especially if Tommy Asu now being suspended, Timber now being injured. He's definitely a player that could be useful for them. I don't know what you think though, James. Yeah, do you know, look, Luke's got Luke's got twelve seconds left. Here, okay, so I would like to hear out what Luke's got to say, and then they'll come back to it. I, I think you make a valid point when it comes to Tierney, but it can also crumble a bit like Kieran Tierney, sadly. So let's hear the last twelve seconds. But yes, I love your energy, Craig. But then we go looking at the likes of Tommy Asu again. I really think it's important that Arsenal do find a way to help replace Timber. It's almost impossible to replace someone with such a great attitude and versatility across that back line. However, we can use the market to hopefully find that centre back slash right back hybrid role and really help us in the long term throughout the season and push City again like we did last year. Right. That's really crucial from Luke, I think, right? Push City again. The <laughs> You know, yesterday's price is not today's price. Yesterday's expectations is not today's expectations, Quickie. So I'm kind of with Luke, right? Because if they do want to battle for the Champions League and really have a proper go at the Premier League, they can't be relying on players that aren't going to be fit all the time. And Tierney is another one of those players. So I think, look, Timber, but in terms of, as Luke said, the versatility that he provides, I'm kind of with him here. And I think there's got to be some options and bodies that you can bring in there. Uh, one name that I just cannot believe hasn't gone anywhere, and I think has been linked with Arsenal, Carl Walker-Peters. Yeah. And Carl Walker-Peters, in terms of someone who could play right back and left back, I think he'd be an amazing option for Liverpool and Liverpool should snap him up. But Liverpool don't want to get in a bidding war again, I would imagine. And Carl Walker-Peters, does he want to go and play for Arsenal after being a Tottenham lad? I don't know. Um, but I think, look, if Arsenal want to win the league this year and you have to look up, you have to dream big... They do need to replace him. That you know, they bought him for a reason. Do you disagree? No, I I understand what you're saying in terms of Arsenal's ambitions this season, um, but I think Arsenal have got other areas of the pitch they they can address. I know that obviously Timber is going to be a huge loss because of the way he started the preseason, because of the way he looked in the Community Shield and in their first game before he got injured. But I think Arsenal have got sufficient enough cover along the back line to to mitigate that injury. And I think maybe we've talked about it before, Jim. I think Arsenal need a goal scorer in a, a, a striker who can put the ball in the back of the net um, on a regular basis if they want to challenge City. I don't think replacing Timber is going to be their biggest issue this season. But that's just me. We, all Villa fans can agree that he's one of the most incredibly frustrating players to watch. Um, and public opinion from the Villa fans does tend to swing every week given his inconsistency and his performances. But he's clearly got the ability to play in the Premier League. He's clearly good enough to be in the team, but he just doesn't show it anywhere near regularly enough. So what he needs to do is show more consistency, basically. It's as easy as that. He needs to show up in away games more. He's only ever scored one away goal in a Villa shirt, and that was against Bolton in the Carabao Cup last year. So if he can improve his consistency, then we have a frightening forward line with Zaniolo, Watkins, Diaby, Ramsey, even Coutinho, and Buendia when he comes back from injury. So. If he can improve his consistency, then there's a lot to look forward to. Uh, so the consistency thing, quickly, let's talk about that because I think essentially, like you're not that you're not as good as you think you are if you're not consistent. <laughs> like I, so I think here, look, sometimes the narrative will be the truth, and I think this seems like it's one of those ones. You know, Leon Bailey's been there for uh, you know a couple of seasons now. It's not totally worked out just as of yet. I wouldn't give up on him, but I think he's you know he's not the go-to starter um I think it might be one where it gets to a point where you look to kind of move him on as the team grows because I think sometimes it's like right player wrong club that would be my feeling about Leon Bailey because I think as Jacob said there is enough quality there I think the problem problem you have is is staying fit I think if he stays fit then you will get exactly what you're after which is that consistency. completely agree the best ability is availability and that's what Leon Bailey struggled with despite the fact that last season he did play 33 league games I only missed five games obviously a lot of those games were from the bench but it's it's a far cry from the player that was sort of by Leverkusen he was so excited and football manager fans know know very well how good Leon Bailey is but it's just not really happened for him at Villa 
this season. They're going to need him, though, because obviously the injury to Buendia, who's going to be out for a while, they're going to need him to step up, especially with European football on the horizon. So um, I expect Leon Bailey to have a better season than he did last year, but I don't see him being at Aston Villa for the long run. Don Solanke isn't a prolific enough goal scorer for the Premier League. That is what many fans of other clubs say about our front man. But listen, Bournemouth fans will tell you, we may well be in the Championship right now if it wasn't for Don. He gives us so much more than goals. And with our previous managers playing a pragmatic approach, Don was often isolated up top on his own. This season, with the new gaffer, the new style, I think he'll flourish. He'll hit double figures. Don't worry about that. Come on, Tommy Jordan. You don't stop that man when he's in his flow. You do not stop him. We do not pause that. Tom, me and you, you look, we know. We go way back, me and Tom Jordan, right? And he's got an amazing Bournemouth channel. Uh, back of the net. Go check it out, guys. Solanke is one that I have I have always suggested that he has got it. He's got it in his locker. Nabade Haroon, I'm calling you out. Someone clip this up and send this to this man. Okay? He doesn't believe in Dom Solanke. Well, Allcott does. And I agree. Double figures for Dom Solanke this season. We move. Let's go. Right, Brentford. <laughs> the truth is, they're just two crucial pieces in a very efficient system. Other pieces include Rico Henry, who may be the most underrated fullback in the Premier League. Pause. Pause. Rico Henry, most underrated uh, left back in the Premier League. I, I, just a quick one, quick. Are you taking it? You taking it? I Are agree. It? I agree. I agree. He agrees. He's gone for it. Okay, fair enough. Christian Norgard, who's incredible defensively and turning the ball over. And Jensen, who's incredible on the ball and creating for the two players up front. I understand what you're saying, but football is about putting the ball in the back of the net. And and, and Buemo and Visa are going to be crucial. Fancy football players will know how important they've been this season. They've been bagging the points. And I think that in Buemo specifically will be very, very important. Until Ivan Tony comes back, in Buemo banging in goals will be crucial to Brentford being successful this season. The narrative surrounding him is that we have good players in his best positions, so he doesn't have to really have a role within the squad. But in reality, this couldn't be further from the truth, and he is on the brink of becoming a starter and will be super important for us this season outside of rotation. Cheers. I agree with this. I think and CISO is being slept on a little bit. Like the numbers that he provides, and actually that game, we spoke about it on the fallout this week, Kweku. And CISO playing in that number 10 role, the sort of number 10 role is kind of coming back a little bit. We saw it with Foden, we saw it with Madison, and CISO provides such a different option for Brighton. And all four goals he played a part with his movement. Again, you can go and watch that video. So, Cashew Chorus, I'm with you. I'm with you. I totally agree. I think, and CISO, I was having a chat with uh, Doogie Critchley on uh, Twitter about this, or I replied to his tweet. I think Enciso will go for more money than Evan Ferguson. Ooh. I think uh, one, I, look, I get he's a striker. I think Enciso is really, really special and will go for 50 million plus in time. I like it. I like it. Lyle Foster cannot do it in the Premier League. Uh, he came in Jan. He had a tough start. He had location issues. He didn't settle right. Uh, he didn't get the training time that he desperately needed off company. Um, but I think after an, an amazing pre-season that he's had and a great first showing against Man City that he's going to change all them opinions on, on him. He's going to have high pressing stats, he's going to get a hat full of goals, he's going to be aggressive, his running's going to be good and he's going to be one of them players to watch in the Premier League I think. So Lyle Foster is the man for Burnley. This is the whole point of the program of that narrative. This is the reason why we, we're doing this. I don't know, and I'm gonna, not going to sit here and declare that I know everything about La Foster. Obviously, I'm looking at his numbers, and he he played 11 games last season, scored one goal. The Premier League is a different kettle of fish. You've got to, you've got to deliver, you've got to give output, you've got to get numbers, especially as a striker. So I'm not going to sit here and disagree with you about a player that I don't know too much about. Obviously, company seen something in in him, and hopefully, for your sake, he scores goals this season for you in the Premier League. One thing that stood out to me in Chelsea's annoying defeat, 3-1 to West Ham, was Sterling. In the first half, he was electric. He was everything right in our attack. On and off the ball, he was electric, quick, dynamic, and getting at their defence. And then in the second half, the opposite, he slowed down the ball. He looked tired. He looked like the Sterling that I'm kind of used to in a Chelsea shirt. And I just think that hot and coldness isn't what we need from an experienced player this season. He needs to be a figurehead in that attack for the younger players to look up to. It needs to get better. This is interesting from Jay Kweku. Obviously, you're a Chelsea fan. The the thing with Sterling, right? 
I thought last year, we, I think we all sort of gave him a bit of a pass because the years prior to that had been so fantastic. And we kind of felt like it was the system that was the problem. But Pochettino's had a you know a whole preseason and Sterling on that right-hand side should be of real value. I've always actually liked him on the right-hand side more so than the left. Like, how do you feel about him? Is it one where people are kind of maybe slightly bored with Sterling because he's been around so long or or has he lost it a little bit, like Jay says? Um, I don't think he's lost it. He's in the bang in his prime. The thing about Raheem Sterling, and this is actually a, a compliment to him, he's the icing on the cake. And so in the City team that are, are thriving and are playing great football, Raheem Sterling's an incredible player. He'll give you incredible numbers. Almost the antithesis of the Jack Grealish. Sterling will give you numbers, but it doesn't necessarily always pass the eye test. Where City have opted for Jack Grealish, who passes the eye test, obviously a very effective player, but doesn't give you numbers. And I think that's what people are expecting from Sterling at Chelsea, to give him numbers because Chelsea struggles to put the ball in the back of the net. I still think he's got a big future at Chelsea, but I do understand why some Chelsea fans are frustrated by the way he plays football. That's fascinating. I haven't thought about that. So he's not got the dragability. That's kind of what you're saying. He can't do like if the team's not playing well, he's not going to drag them up. He actually he's just there that's going to get it going once it is going. Yeah, once it's going, there's no better player in the world that you want in your team. You saw it at City, City of England. When England are ticking, when City were ticking, Raheem Sterling's one of the best players in the world. Um, and this is not an indictment on his skill set, but it's just the type of player that he is. He needs other players around him to be performing at the highest level. He hasn't got that at Chelsea quite yet, but if you if you have patience with him and you give him a season or two to where Chelsea will get to the level they need to get to. I think Raheem Sterling will be a key player for Chelsea going forward. This is Edward's third season for Palace now, and he's proven that he can't be our main striker. However, since the return of Roy Hodgson, he's got three goals in the league and three more in pre-season, looking sharp along the way. He can consistently score when he's confident, give him a run of games, and do not rotate him with Mateta, and you will see him get more goals. He also seems to be playing as more of a poacher rather than being involved in build-up, which is not his strength. We saw this against Sheffield United getting him his goal, including an offside one as well. Given our creative talent, he can thrive this season and hopefully score some more goals. I had one problem. I've got one problem with the giant horse. I presume that's not your real name. Go on. Okay. The one thing I'm struggling... Right. I thought everything that everything that he said was absolutely spot on. Like Palace have always struggled to score up to, up top. They do have creativity. He is a poacher and him playing in that role is, is far better for him, I think. But you cannot use preseason goals as a stat. You can, you just can't. That's I'm not a metric. It's not a metric. That, <laughs> you can't use that as a metric. You can't say, well, he's had a great preseason. Okay? We can't be using and that in itself speaks volumes for me. Because when you're chucking those numbers you know, three and three seasons specific there, <laughs> then you, you str- that's going to make your argument struggle a little bit. Look, he's only 25. I, I think there's a there's definitely a player in there. Again, they need to be thriving. They need to be creating. And under Hodgson, you've got a better chance of doing that. Elise's still there. Eze's my boy, as you guys know. So I think Edward could come good. I agree. I think they should stick with him this year. The narrative this week around Everton is that Jordan Pickford is not a good enough goalkeeper. And the four goals we've conceded today against Aston Villa are there to prove that. But in reality, he is one of the elite goalkeepers. He finished fifth last season, expected goals saved per 90. Um, he was up there for expected assists as well as for goalkeepers. Um, he is not the problem. It is the players in front of him that are the problem. He is one of the elite goalkeepers and the four goals should not mislead anyone to thinking different. I love modern football statistics. Expected assist for a goalkeeper is amazing. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. Um, I do agree, though. I do agree. John Pickford is... Uh, I wouldn't necessarily put him as an elite goalkeeper, but Everton couldn't find any better. I know that, obviously, the result against Aston Villa on the weekend was a bit of a disaster, and he was in my FPL team, so I've got a bone to pick with him. But John Pickford is still, yeah, he's still a top goalkeeper. Um, and there's a reason why he starts for England. There's a reason why he's never let England down. I really like Jordan Pickford. I know sometimes his demonstrative manner can sometimes put people off, but in terms of a goalkeeper that you want, especially a team like Everton who are going to be struggling at the bottom of the table, you can't get much better than Jordan Pickford. The reason Pickford struggles is because he's playing for Everton. Yeah. If he was playing for Arsenal or these other teams, I think he, he would be loving life. I'm amazed that he stayed. That's that's the biggest thing that I don't get with Pickford is why he stayed there. Because surely... Spurs was there for him. Surely a, Spurs was there. Yeah. Spurs, I mean, probably still is there. Yeah. I mean, obviously he'd signed a deal now. But yeah, that, that's why people will think that he's not up to it. Yeah. Because he's playing for a team that ships goals. Yeah. 
Unfortunately, there's no escaping the narrative that we're going to struggle to replace Mitrovic, and I don't think Jimenez or Vinicius are the long-term answer. Mitrovic does turn 29 next month, and with the oldest squad in the Premier League, Fulham will come out of this quite well if we reinvest the money in one of Europe's top young strikers. Uh, someone like Balogun, Ekatike, Brozier or Gift Orban may be worth the risk. Unfortunately though, as is the Fulham way, I fear that will leave our business way too late um, and we'll probably bring in Che Adams on transfer deadline day. <laughs> <laughs> I like Che Adams. I like Che Adams, okay? Right, I, you know, that was, that was brutal. <laughs> 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 Do you know what? I think what I will say, there's obviously been a very clear Fulham-Arsenal link over the last couple of years. Balogun might be the guy. Look, it's a bit of pressure on a, on a young lad. If you can get him on a permanent, that would be amazing. But I think Joe's absolutely right here. They have to invest. They're probably going to have to invest the bulk of it. But if they can invest in someone that they're going to get eight years and 60 million because they're going to be great as well, then that's a that's a great bit of business. But that's going to be crucial for Fulham this season if they don't want to have that second season syndrome happening to them. Luke Saborslai is the man I'm putting forward for the narrative this week. What a player, a man of the match performance and a winning your debut does not get much better than that. And he will be the guy to control the games for us this year. You know, missing out on Bellingham after tracking him for so long. Us Liverpool fans had our doubts, but I've lost my doubts now. I cannot wait to see more of Sobozla and what he's going to bring to the table. You know, he is brilliant. And I also think a quick shout out to Diaz. So dangerous and direct on that wing. Those two will be key stars for us this year. Archie, I, I, love, I love your point about Sabozla. It's so exciting. I disagree with the fact that you think he's going to control games. I think that's going to be more down to McAllister. But in terms of an X factor, in terms of somebody who can create something out of nothing, Sabozla is going to be that man. Liverpool fans are going to be very, very excited watching him play this season. They're going to be also a bit frustrated. He's got the, the Bruno Fernandes about him in terms of you, he's unpredictable going forward. But what he can guarantee is he's going to get fans off their seat and he will hopefully, for your sake, give you numbers. So I do agree with that one. Everyone always talks about how long Pelly has been at Luton and what he's done throughout his Luton career. But not many people talk about the, you know, the capabilities and the consistency of, you know, stepping up each division, which not many players have, have done, you know. As the records say, he is the first player to go from non-league and play at every single division with the same club. The consistency levels which he's done over the last couple of seasons and especially throughout his Luton career is something that definitely gets overlooked. Love this. Absolutely love this shout. Look, when you come up, you. so what happens is you. if you spend like hundreds of millions of pounds and get rid of absolutely everyone, then you have absolutely no chemistry, no fighting spirit there, no consistency of what got you into the league. Pelly Ruddock is exactly that kind of player that you need in and around that squad. He also plays in a position where I think you can acclimatise in time. They're also going to be quite careful in how they play. So I think it's one where look, he's been good enough to adapt each season or at each level as well that he's risen to. So I agree. Give give Pelly Ruddock, a, give him a minute, OK? Let's give him to Christmas. It's going to be a tough season for Luton. We know that, right? But... So that's why that grit, that determination, that ability to, you know, hang in there is going to be crucial. And that's why these kind of players are going to be so important. So give them a second. I agree. The current narrative at Manchester City that we absolutely need a new signing. I've essentially on the right hand side, as we've seen Paqueta, Verts, and Olmo linked to the club. However, when I look at the Newcastle game on the weekend, I saw a Phil Foden performing in the role of Kevin De Bruyne exceptionally. And I look at Cole Palmer and some of the performances he's put in. I think we have some good youngsters in the squad that will supplement the side throughout the season. And I don't necessarily think we absolutely need a new signing. It might help if we get one, but I don't think it's absolutely necessary. How do you feel about this one, Cookie? <sighs> Well, Jeremy Doku's on his way, so they, they Man City feel like they do need a new signing. Uh, but I understand what you're saying in terms of you don't want to hold the progression of a player like Phil Foden. We've talked about it multiple times, James, me and you, on, on multiple channels, about Phil Foden and this is his time to rise. This is his time to shine. I understand what you're saying in terms of Man City not needing signings, but because you have had some injuries and had some, had some outgoings, I do understand why the hierarchy of Man City do want to bring in reinforcements. I think you've got to continue to be ruthless. That's what Man City have done. Uh, on that right-hand side, what, one thing I will say is uh, it was all about Foden and he was awesome. And you don't want to lose that. And actually having someone like Doku might kind of take up some space that he would look to utilise, possibly. But 
I, I think also you need those you need those bodies there. You need to be able to give yourself options and you're going to be playing 60 games again this season. So you had to bring in someone. You can't lose all those players and in particular not have those options on the right-hand side and not replace them at all. Although I agree, I think Cole Palmer has been pretty impressive so far. One narrative surrounding Manchester United is Casemiro becoming a detriment to the team. But in reality for me, it's the system failing Casemiro and not the other way around. We've seen last season he would have a number eight next to him. Now we're playing two advanced eights, almost tens in Mount and Bruno. And we're starting to see his failings as a midfielder or what he isn't good at. We need to quickly get someone who can play that position and really help him with his capabilities. And we've seen last season how important he can be to the team. This is interesting. I've seen this a lot. This has really crept in for Man United uh, in terms of the discourse around them or the narrative around them maybe might be the thing I should just talk about there. With Casemiro, they're kind of just suggesting, okay, oh, what, okay, what's he, what's his thing? Oh, he's a bit older, isn't he? Right, so his legs have gone. Now, I'm generally kind of not big on that. But at the same time, I remember, I remember Hugh Wizzy saying um, Alexis Sanchez's legs had gone. And I was like, what are you on about? He's just knackered because he's played, you know, Copper Americas and, and everything else in between... Uh, for like four years but he was kind of right that you know as much as as much as it, it, you don't just lose your legs like that you actually you are in that period of time where you do lose your legs so I'm a little bit confused uh, with Casemiro I agree I think look they need another player they need that Tony Cruz to help him shine and do what he's brilliant at um, I don't think his legs have gone in the last three months, but he, obviously he is getting a little bit older. So if you give him that island as a single pivot and he's got to deal with all of that, that's a lot of work for, for him to do. And maybe someone like Mason Mount is a bit different to Ericsson. And although Ericsson doesn't have those same legs, he's, that means he's not going to get forward as much. And so there's maybe not that same space that he's got to cover right now. How are you feeling about Casemiro and Man United as a whole? It's difficult because what people expected Eric Ten Hag to do when he came to his country initially is completely different to like the style of football that he's implementing currently in Man United. Um, he made it clear in pre-season that he wants Man United to be the best transition team in the world, hyper-aggressive, super fast, super athletic, super quick. But then if you're transitional going forwards, you've got to remember going backwards as well. And I think that's what Casemiro suffered with in terms of players running by him, and which makes him look a lot older than he actually is. Um, they haven't bought complementary pieces around him. Mason Mount and Bruno Fernandes give you something different in midfield, but maybe not, they don't bring out the best in a player like Casemiro because they're not inclined to, to, to provide the cover that he needs. I think Man United will be fine, but they do need a volume pass from midfield. They need somebody who's a, who's a tempo dictator, who can put the foot on the ball and slow things down. I think it's a bit too fast for Manchester United at the moment, and things are just bypassing them. Um, you saw that in the second half against Spurs. You saw that all game against Wolves when Cunha was just running through them. Um, so it's a problem. It's an issue that needs to be looked at for Manchester United, but the sky's not falling quite yet. Casemiro is still a world-class footballer. Fabian Scherr and Sven Botman are the best centre-back partnership Newcastle United have had in the Premier League era. They're the most successful since Beresford and Harry in 95-96 and they perfectly encapsulate what you want from a modern centre-back partnership. Scherr is the aggressor, stepping out really well from the back line, generally is very progressive with his passing and his ball carrying. Sven Botman is the man mountain, the impassable brick wall at the back, who uses his height and physicality to dominate in the air and on the ground and is generally the bedrock of everything good our defensive unit does. Ginger Swiss, first and foremost, can I get your voice on an ASMR channel? <laughs> and if you could send me the link to that, that would be wonderful. Lovely little gentle Scottish twang I'm hearing there, Ginger Swiss. I also totally agree with this. Uh, I was, look, Man City were really impressive in that game against Newcastle at home. But I like that this is the narrative for Newcastle. It shows that Newcastle fans have got their heads switched on, switched on, screwed on, because the thing is that those two were very, very durable. They dealt with a lot. Alvarez, Haaland and Foden just buzzing around them all the time. Haaland overall, I thought, was pretty quiet in the game. I think, look, I'm thinking of competition for them when it comes to Newcastle's greatest Premier League centre-backs. I'm thinking Albert, are we chucking him in there? I think he's maybe got to get in there somehow. Darren Peacock, older people will know who he is. Definitely not getting in there. Um, so I think, yeah, I think you're right. These are the two. And Shah has been a revelation. And he's really good looking. 
The narrative is Taiwo were one year's banging in the goals and new goalkeeper Matt Turner is making some huge saves and that's why Forrest were able to get the win on Friday. But the truth is the difference maker in the match was midfielder Ryan Yates. Now Yates did not start but he was huge when he stepped on the pitch at 1-1. In 20 minutes he made three recoveries, had a 100% tackle success rate and provided some stability to the Forest midfield when Sheffield United were gaining some momentum. As the vice captain, Yates is a proven leader, he lights a fire underneath the rest of the team and he deserves his flowers. Oh, oh. You deserve your flowers for that energy. I love the energy. Um, and I, I completely agree. I was one of the very few people who was actually watching that game was producing the Sheffield United, uh, not the Forest game. <laughs> it wasn't on TV for some reason. Um, and yeah. Ryan Yates, like I say, industrious. He's perfect for what not in the forest trying to do. And the one year is just that mid-table bully, man. I love what I see from him. Um, last season, Back in the last season, he showed that he's a Premier League proven striker. Obviously, didn't go well for him in Liverpool. Didn't get uh, minutes tools on loan, left, right and centre. But at Forest, he's absolutely perfect. I think he brings the best out of your other players as well. Obviously, got on the score sheet, could have had a couple more as well. And I think he's going to be a crucial player for Forest and also for FBL managers everywhere across the country. absolutely true we are lacking the attacking midfield and the striker positions without this final third play we're going to struggle to put points on the board and to create chances and to score goals however last friday harmer showed us that he can be a first time starter every time and a real quality player maybe even a leader without harmer we're going to have a really hard season and with him it's still going to be difficult but i believe we can do it and so you should sam uh, I like that little bit of belief there. I, look, sometimes the narrative will be the truth. Can we just accept that sometimes? And that's what Sam's done here. I agree. Look, that game, from, from what I saw, I watched the highlights. So I, I didn't see the whole game. But Sheffield United could have easily got something from that game if they were able to take their chances. You've lost someone like and die. I know everyone's talking about him all the time, but the bottom line is you need goals. You need to score goals. And Hamer scored an absolute screamer, but you can't rely on him to do that every single week. So Sam's spot on, I think. Like they need they need reinforcements and in particular they need a striker in my opinion. Sar is the perfect eight. He can also drop off and help in the defensive areas. Got an eye for a goal as well, which was good to see at the weekend. Basuma is like a brand new signing. You know, when you see in the market, midfielders going for hundreds of million pounds and he only costs 25 million. He looks fantastic under a coach who can actually progress his career on. And you look at the weekend in the last two games, better ball progression, better passing, you know, dribbling. It's just a very good midfield. And when Bentagu comes back and with Madison as well, have we got one of the better midfields in the Premier League now? Potentially. Oh. <laughs> oh. Oh. Sonny. Uh, who's, Sonny sounds exactly like Jamie O'Hara. Yeah, he does. He does. Maybe we'll just put it out there. Just put it out there. first fans sound the same. What I love from Sonny <laughs> there is that the optimism that kind of <laughs> emboldens this part of the season, this time of the season, I, it's, it's calling Sarr and Basuma the best midfield in the, in the Premier League maybe a step too far. Yeah, possibly, but it's the beginning of the season. Spurs have got four points out of the first two games. It's, it's time to be optimistic. I think Basuma is a player reborn under Ange Postecoglou. I think that he's going to have a great season. He's going to return to the player that we saw um, at Brighton. There's this narrative that when Brighton sell players, they never succeed elsewhere. And I think Basuma is going to break that curse. I think he's going to have a really, really good season. And Saar performing well as well, only bodes well for Spurs going forward. There's reasons for Spurs fans to be optimistic, but don't get too ahead of yourselves. <laughs> I'm sure. when you say those three when you bring Ben Tancor into it the only problem I have is you know we're talking about Casemiro before like what Basuma's so what makes him so special is that he's he is that volume passer he's having 100 touches a game but he's also got the legs to sort of progress the ball as well and get forward at times so but it might be one of those where Ben Tancor you would obviously want to bring in because he's you know he's amazing but can they both have the ball all the time? Or do you just allow those numbers to get sort of slashed in half and you've got just wonderful players on the pitch? That will be the interesting thing for me. I think with Saar, and look, it's going to be interesting to see how he gets on this season. Will he be a regular this season? How much is Oliver Skip going to play this season as well? But Basuma is the real deal, guaranteed. Truth is, there's so much more to his game than that. From his leadership qualities, his ability to press the opposition and how comfortable he is on the ball. Even after losing Declan Rice, with James Will Prowse on the side, Alvarez coming in and hopefully keeping the hold of Pakatar, not only will our midfield improve this season, 
it will be far more balanced. Oof. Jim, I don't. Do you know what? I don't want to talk about West Ham after go what on. they did to Chelsea this, <laughs> this weekend. So I'll let you go on this one. Okay. So yeah. Well, first of all, look, Jack. You've bought him for set piece. You've got big boys in that West Ham team. This is David Moyes' football team, and you have bought him for that. And that is his superpower, and that's not something to be ashamed of. That's why he would have been in the World Cup squad for me. I would have got him in there um, because because of what he brings there. Now, you don't, you're not a Premier League player if you can't do the other bits. And I think he does the other bits probably better, and they get overshadowed by exactly what you're saying, which is the, the set piece delivery. But that midfield, if you keep Pakatar, if you do have Alvarez and you do have Ward Prowse, is that midfield three better than the Tottenham midfield three? Oof. In terms of the profiles and the mix there, that is a lovely mix. Let me know in the comments down below, guys. I think it's tight because obviously, look, we're all feeling Tottenham right now. I get it. But that is a really strong West Ham midfield. And look, if it does play out as well as you know Jack's hoping for, that's an amazing use of the De the uh, Declan Rice money, and and actually was a signing that we said on the James Lawrence Allcott channel. So make sure you've subscribed. <laughs> right, Wolves. Fabio Silva and Sasha Kladic won't be enough to save Wolves this season, and the truth is that might be right. Despite the amount of chances created and an aggressive style of play from Gary O'Neill, we are still proving to everybody that we don't have a natural goal scorer. Since Jimenez's injury in 2020 and multiple attempts to bring in a new number nine we still find ourselves the lowest scorers in the Premier League. But if we keep up with the amount of chances created and gain some fluidity and some confidence in our front three, I think we'll be okay this season. I feel sorry for Wolves this season. I feel sorry for them. I I really like Gary No, I really like I really like Wolves as a football club. Obviously, Jane, we went to visit the ground recently. Um, but mm. I just think it's going to be a tough ask for them this season. Fabio Silva is a player that obviously came in with a lot of hype, came in for a lot of money. I just don't think he's it. I don't think he's it in the Premier League. I don't think he's going to score enough goals. Obviously, Optimism Wolves is going to be pretty low after getting turned around by Brighton. But Brighton's going to do that to a lot of teams this season. But I just don't see where the points or the goals are going to come from uh, this season with Wolves. And unless they make a sign that's going to transform them in terms of putting the ball in the back of the net, I think they're going to struggle this season and probably go down. Unfortunately, I do like the club. Guys, we've been absolutely blown away by the response to the narrative. You guys have got involved in the Discord server. You created an amazing community that's only going to build. And as a result, me and Jim want to give away something to you guys. This week, it's Drip Socks. Drip by name, drip by nature. You would have seen these socks about, guys. They're really cool, obviously, for the average five-a-side players. They focus on four key areas, the drip, the grip, the fit, and the quality. And the guys with Drip Socks have given us the ability to give some socks away to you guys. It's not here that you get them, though. You've got to get involved in our Discord channel. Obviously, the link is in the description. Obviously, at the end of this video, you've got two links to check out, guys. It's the link to Drip Socks uh, to check the socks out and also the link to our Discord, which gives you the opportunity to potentially win a pair of Drip Socks socks.